In our previous lecture, we discussed semantics, the study and knowledge of the meanings of words and phrases. Yet we all know that in interaction, the meaning we convey is often not literal. We sometimes need to read between the lines to understand what people around us really mean. The subfield of linguistics that studies how meaning is constructed in interaction is called pragmatics. Take a few seconds to read through this comic strip. In it, we see that the green figure apparently deliberately interprets the red figure's request to take out the trash as the request to put it just outside the door. Green followed the directions given to her literally. She took the trash out and put it outside. However, in ordinary interaction, when somebody asks us to take out the trash, they generally mean putting it in a bin outside, not on the floor next to the door. The meaning to take out the trash is not literal, but rather is constructed in cultural and interactional context. Pragmatics studies the mechanisms by which it is done and how people convey and understand meaning differently depending on the context of their interaction and utterance, depending on the general principles of interaction, including politeness, and on the goals of both the speaker and the listener. Context is crucial to meaning in interaction. It is the context that often determines which forms of address we use with different people, which things we're allowed to say and which ones we're not allowed to say, and how we're supposed to say them. In no particular order of priority, context includes the speaker's physical environment, their shared knowledge, their social setting, and the previous talk. So let's address those one by one. Physical surroundings include everything around us. If somebody tells you, open the door, in order to understand which door they mean, you have to be aware of the physical space around you and, in particular, of any doors in it. Shared knowledge is equally important. Imagine the following situation. You and your friend know about a free concert of a famous musician on campus. The concert is open only to the students of your university, but neither you nor your friend can go because you have work commitments. Your friend tells you that she might try and get out of work and reschedule her shift in order to go to the concert. Yet she is not helpful. Her boss is extremely strict and not accommodating. The next day you run into her and you ask, So, did you go? And she responds, Yes, it was great. To an outsider, this conversation would be incomprehensible. Go where? What was great? Yet you and your friend share the knowledge of the concert and the obstacles you both had to going. So for you, the conversation makes complete sense. The social settings also affect our construction of meaning and choices of language. Consider an example on the screen in front of you. Hello, Mrs. Baldwin. Oh, hello, Michael. We can assume from this conversation that Mrs. Baldwin is in a superior social position to Michael. She may be older, she may be his teacher, or his boss, or all three. But she's also possibly friendly. It is her higher social status that drives Michael to address her by the title and her last name. And it drives her to address Michael by his first name. If she addressed Michael as, for example, Mr. Caldwell, the meaning she would have conveyed would be of social distance and formality. Finally, Previous talk is crucial to understanding meaning in interaction. We interpret what other people say by relevance to what was said before and what will come after. In the sample dialogue you see in front of you, the phrase to the bank would not have been understandable if it were not a response to the question, where did Jennifer go? The physical surroundings, shared knowledge, the social settings, and the previous talk all work together to create a relevant context for understanding what we mean when we interact with each other. Let's look at one example of how meaning is constructed in interaction. You are very familiar with this situation, I am sure. 
A teacher asks a child in her class, Ian, what are you doing? Ian responds, nothing. Why does Ian respond the way he does? Isn't he supposed to be doing something? Normally, children are not allowed just to sit in class loafing doing nothing. What is the meaning of Ian's response? You no doubt interpreted the teacher's question as an accusation of misbehavior on Ian's part and his utterance is a denial of such misbehavior. But why do we interpret it so? There is nothing in the interaction that uses the words like misbehavior or wrong. And not only do we understand the interaction as a conversation about possible misbehavior, but so does Ian. After all, he claims he didn't do nothing without missing a beat. We all, including the hypothetical teacher and Ian, understand this brief exchange the way we do because we know what the physical setting is, the classroom. And we have a shared knowledge of the rules of conduct in the classroom. That is, that children are supposed to do what they're told in the classroom and teachers know what they're doing. And don't ask the question, what are you doing, unless the child is not doing what he's supposed to. We also know that there are hierarchical social roles involved and teachers are allowed to ask the question and students are obligated to answer. Moreover, teachers are in the position to demand that children engage in classroom tasks at all time and the children are obligated to comply and therefore they are not allowed to do anything outside the tasks assigned to them. You see how multiple facets of context drive our production and understanding of language and interaction? Now, in our analysis of the brief interaction between the teacher and the student, we used words like the teacher accuses the student of misbehavior and the student denies the misbehavior. To put it precisely, when we use language to accomplish things in interaction, we do things with words. Each utterance we produce has a purpose. A person asking a question is requesting information. A person producing a request directs the actions of others. A person who borrowed money from you and says, I will pay you back on Tuesday, commits themselves to doing a particular action in the future. This action is understood to be beneficial to the recipient. After all, which ones of us don't want our money repaid if a friend borrowed it from us. On the other hand, if the action the speaker commits him or herself to is harmful to the recipient, we treat it as a threat, not a promise of something we'll be looking forward to. When we invite somebody to have a cup of coffee with us, our intent is to get them to commit to a particular action. And if we make assertions, our goal is to inform others. The actions we perform through language are called speech acts. We can perform speech acts in a direct or an indirect manner. Let's compare three types of speech acts. As we look at examples, try to take a note of how direct speech acts are different from the indirect ones. We can make a direct request by saying, give me a tall latte. Or we can phrase the same request as a statement about our preferences rather than a command to the recipient. I'd like a tall latte, please. We can invite people directly by telling them, please come to my party on Saturday. Or we can do so indirectly by informing them about this party. We can seek information directly for example, asking the recipient, where is my watch? Or we can do so indirectly by asking the recipient if they've seen the watch. Note, if the recipient in this case says, yes, I've seen your watch, and then walks away, we'd be really ticked because she didn't really provide us with the information we wanted and asked for the location of the watch. So, did you notice the difference between direct and indirect speech acts? Right. Direct speech acts convey the meaning literally. Their grammatical structure corresponds to their intended job. 
We ask for things or invite people by telling them what to do, and we use imperative forms to do so. We seek information by asking specific questions about this information, where, when, how, and so on. Indirect speech acts convey meaning in a sort of roundabout way. One needs to understand their context precisely to understand the meaning. Their grammatical structure is often that of a different speech act. For example, we can phrase requests as questions about our own abilities. When we say, can I have a tall latte? We're not asking the recipient to tell us whether we're capable of consuming the said caffeinated beverage. We know perfectly well that we are. We're using the question to convey a request to tell the recipient what to do. When we ask if the recipient has seen our watch, we're not really interested in whether they've seen it. We want to know where the watch is and whether the recipient can tell us. The indirect speech acts are, well, indirect. They're not understood literally by functioning adult members of a particular speech community. Let's have a little practice identifying what a particular speech act is, what its meaning is, and whether it is direct or indirect. Imagine the following situation. You are shopping at a grocery store after work. You are wearing your work uniform, but it is not from this store. A customer approaches you and asks, Where can I find canned peas? You don't really know, since you don't work here and you maybe don't even shop here a lot. But you understand that the customer mistook you for a store employee. So you say, I'm sorry, I don't work here. Where can I find canned peas is a direct speech act formulated as a question seeking specific information. I don't work here is an indirect speech act. It does not tell the customer where the canned peas are. It doesn't even tell the customer that you don't know where the canned peas are. Yet it provides the customer with the information the customer needs to both understand your answer as a I don't know, and as the reason for you not knowing. What allows us to understand the intended meaning of both direct and especially indirect speech acts is that we all assume that all of us follow the general cultural principles of interaction rather than say things at random and out of the blue. We'll discuss these principles in the next lecture.